so we'll call the select board meeting for Wednesday, November 17th, 2021 to order. Uh, here from the select board is me, David Phil, Joyce Chunglo, Jane Nevinsmith, Amy Parsons, and John Weskevitz. All votes will be taken via roll call and this is being recorded. So uh, first thing we will do is we have posted for 6 p.m. a reopening of the, or of the class tax classification hearing for FY22. Um, we continued that from our last meeting. So why don't I start with, uh, is Linda here? Linda, how about Linda and Carolyn? Do you have anything else that we need to add or update from last week? We'll start off that way. I have nothing else to add. Okay. Did we not want to wait till this week to have the finance committee chime in on that? Is that that's why we actually waited? So if they're here, can they jump yep. in? Well, Linda's on there too. What, Linda, was there anything you wanted to add before they jumped in? Uh, no, there wasn't. I was just having a little trouble. I, it's the first time I've been Zoom on that computer, so this computer. So, um, no, we did have a, you know, we've had meetings during the week, but I don't think we have any new information unless there's questions that come up. So, thank you. All right. And then, um, let's see here. Is Dan on yet? I don't see him. Yeah, he's on. Oh, there he is, Dan. Yep. Okay. How about finance? Anybody from finance want to chime in? Um, I know you guys met since our last meeting. Sure, we can chime in. I think um, everyone from our meeting will be um, attending tonight that are that will be here. Um, so when we met last week, um, we had um, a presentation and then we had a vote. There was um, uh, four of us in attendance yes, uh, last week. The vote was three to one um, in favor of a single tax rate. Uh, so the finance committee is very much opposed. Um, well, there is a three to one um, opposed to splitting it. Um, I, have, I, I figured I'd just give you uh, quickly a few of my reasons um, and then the others would like to chime in just to, so you can hear from everybody, not just one person. Um, so personally, I don't have it. I don't have a business here. I just, I just feel that um, my actual tax bill by by going for a single tax rate will actually go up. So it costs me money, um, but I just feel like it's the right thing to do. So that's why I'm going to say a few things. So being against the split tax rate, um, I asked why we why was the split tax or why the values were so low for commercial. The values of the commercial are going so low is because of sales and it's the sales during the COVID and that's what we all know. So basically what um, I rather foster the growth. So I feel that there was a reason for the um, assessed value going as low as it has on the sales and aren't, aren't they due the money? Some of them were almost, were not even open at all during the year. So they, they could really use the break so that that was a, a big deal and i feel like they are they are due that money also we talk about abatements every single year when we go through this and the abatements um one of the reasons why they uh, we always say is it would be hard and the abatements would be very costly to the town i feel that even if we do we still might get some but i i feel like this would be putting salt on the wound and that there's a, a better chance that we would get more abatements if we do a split tax rate. Um, the, let's see, um, they, the commercial department or the commercial um, route nine, they pay more than their fair share um, that of the tax burden. Um, they do pay a lot in taxes. Um, so I do feel like they are our bread and butter. They are what keeps our tax rate in town as low as it is. It's a great place to live and they keep our taxes low. Um, and at, you know, when our, we're looking at the $400, uh, that's what the increase will be. That, that's what we're being told on a, um, if we keep a single rate, you divide it by 12, it will make an average person's mortgage payment go up about $34 a month. I don't wanna see it happen, but if it has to happen, 
to keep us in a good spot, I, I say that's what we should do. Um, the other thing is it's hard to go back. We talk about it over and over and over again. It's hard to go back. The best intentions sometimes, you know, they say it's easy, but best intentions, it is hard in some cases. Our best intentions in the past for the, um, the when we take out of the stabilization, we take out of the stabilization several years ago because we said, oh, it's, uh, we just couldn't get the free cash certified. So we just took out a stabilization. It'll go right back, it'll go right back. It was several years before because things happen. They just do. They, our best intentions, sometimes it just happens and it's hard to go back. Now, some of the things that are gonna happen for um, the following years, when we say they're gonna go back, we have inflation, we have um, the supply problems, we have labor problems. And here's one big one that we haven't been discussing, Route 9. Route 9 is going to be all torn up for several years because of that Route 9 project. And our, you know, sales all up and down Route 9 are going to be affected by that. Um, so that's, that's going to be a big hit. So, uh, you know, people are going to avoid um, Hadley for a little while during that time, I would think. The, um, the last thing I would just want to say is, you know, I don't see the other towns doing this. The, uh, you know, we, they should be in the same boat. They should be doing, you know, they should be, Northampton didn't do it. The other towns all around us, it's not happening where we're, you see that all around splitting the tax rate. Um, if, if it was, uh, you know, something that is easy as it is, you would see it happening everywhere. And I don't see any of the other towns around doing this. Um, so I'm going to stop it at that. And I'm going to ask um, someone else to chime in, please. Paul? Sure. Um, I, I want to support what Amy said. I, you know, I have both commercial property and I have the same number of commercial units as I have residential property in town. So personally, I'm going to take a hit on either side. To me, this is about standing with our businesses as a common, you know, we're a commonwealth. We're all supposed to pull together here. And I feel like we have depended on businesses in our town to support the town tax rate. I know that it that the impression one gets when one drives Route 9 is that these are a lot of multinational companies or at least national and large regional companies, especially when you get down by the malls. But from where my business is to where you know Lowe's is, is not that. It's almost all small businesses. It's all local. Some of them vote here. Some of them live here. Some of them just live in a, a neighboring town. But all of these businesses have suffered. My rental i have some rentals that are empty we've never had empty rentals here um and i have you know several units that are down um and you know we may get renters later this year we might not but we i believe that when we when we voted through the freeze last year at the firehouse we told people that we're giving everybody a break now but next year everybody's going to have to double down and now to avoid doing that we're going to go after the businesses who don't vote. And I just, in principle, it just, I think it's the wrong thing and the wrong message to send. You know, um, it's not just about being pro-business, it's about being fair. We have some businesses in our town who have suffered greatly. Some of them are big companies, but some of them are just family owned businesses. And most of them are. And <clears throat> this has been an incredible year and it's not over yet for the businesses. We're still dealing with um, changes in the way the economy is working, um, uh, much higher costs to get product, much higher costs to get, I mean, even there was an article in the paper about a bicycle shop in town that, that's having trouble having to work around to get parts. You know, they're all suffering. And now we're going to increase on them so the voting public doesn't. You know, we depend on these businesses to pay our taxes. And I think this is absolutely the wrong time to do this. You know, if you go back uh, two years before COVID hit and you look at the average increase that we had on a household, according when I talked to Dan about this in two different meetings, let's say $125, $130 a year is the increase that the average house is seeing, okay? And we had one year where we froze it. Now we're going to double it up. And then the year after, it's going to go back to normal, we think. So if you take a five-year average, even with the higher tax rate this year, the average householder is going to see what they would have seen anyway 
over the five year period by taking the, the savings last year. And I, I don't think that's such a bad deal. Um, you know, I, I'm, I moved here from Northampton. Um, I, my business is here. All my money is invested in this town. I think this is just a terrible decision. And I think when you, when you take a, a business and when you say, you know, Dan, and I'm, and I'm not trying to single Dan out. I know all of the people who are supporting this are well-intended and they have their reasons. I happen to disagree with some of them. Okay. And, but, you know, one of the arguments that was put forward is that the People's Bank location just sold for $1.6 million. Well, I, I would bet good money that if you were, if I tried to use that to value my building, to, to create, to take my commercial property and multiply up by square footage, what I, I mean, my buildings would be worth a ton of money if I use that as a benchmark for the number of square footage and acreage that's there. Um, if you use that as the sale, as the comparable. What I'm saying is that that particular sale is a keystone. It's a hole in the middle of a donut of development. It's the last holdout. So if you pick that up, which I believe whoever bought it did, when that area get that backside of the, of the strip mall that just got built in the front gets developed, they need that property. So it's like the last holdout. And that's why I think that went for as much as it did. I think, I think any, I think any appraiser for a commercial loan would discount that as an unusual sale for that reason. That's what I'm saying. I don't think you can apply it that way. I don't think real estate market has recovered at that level yet. And, and I think we have another year of this here at least. And I'm hoping that's all it is. That's what I say. I, I know you're all well-intended and I know this is gonna be very difficult, but I think you have to tell the voters that we gave you a break last year Yes, you're going to pay more this year, but next year to go down, look at the five-year average. It's what it has always been. Okay. And we need to protect our businesses. Thank you very much. Uh, Dylan? All right, so I was the one opposing vote. I'm in favor of doing a split tax rate. Um, I'm in favor of doing a split tax rate, rate for this year and this year only. I want to make that very clear that this is a one-time thing. Uh, and I think that this is the year to do a split tax rate um, for a few reasons. Um, we're looking at this situation where we have this weird, uh, with COVID, we had a different, we had a split away from property and commercial assessment value. And a lot of the commercial values is based on the sales and receipts and that's backward looking. Um, we saw just the other day with Linda sending out the, the documents and what we've seen already, we're already uh, doubled where we were this time last year. We're at 954,000 uh, in receipts, 109 versus 514,000 last year. So the recovery is here. It's happening. It's happening on Route 9. Um, I also want to clear up some misconceptions. Just because the split tax rate will change, the assessment that's being changed and split so that the end bill is the same. So it's going to be smooth. There's no tax break that this is gonna get anyone. This is not raising additional taxes for the town of Hadley in any way. It's just changing how it gets split up. Um, another thing that I wanna bring up on behalf of Dan and Linda, um, after talking with them, they have never recommended a split tax rate in the past. This is the first year they are recommending it. And it's due to some of those reasons and other reasons that they've made clear. Um, this is the recommendation to do the split tax rate. And based on their presentations and speaking with them, it doesn't come lightly. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up, um, the concept of it being too hard to go back. We saw last year when we did dip the tax rate down to the $12 to give everyone a break. Uh, that was one time thing where we dipped into funds that we don't usually dip into. And we're not doing that this year. So that was a one time thing that can be similar to this. That isn't a repeatable thing. Another thing with that tax uh, decrease last year down to $12, that benefited commercial just the same as it benefit, benefited uh, private real estate. It didn't just benefit the people with private homes in this town. Commercial also got that break as well. The other thing that I wanted to say was, um, uh, well, no, that's, that's pretty much it. The one thing that I did wanna bring up that was brought to my attention and I'm hoping that maybe Dan can speak to it a little bit more, um, was uh, 
the the impact that it might have on the farming community. I know we have a strong farming community. Um, and there was mentioned that there was a presentation. I missed one of the presentations and there was a talk about there was something that showed minimal impact to the farming community. So I was interested if Dan would be able to speak to that. Dan, you got oh, uh, Yeah, most of the, the farmers in town, the presentation that I, I did at the last meeting, I took eight what I would consider active farmers not people that are renting land, not somebody that's got a couple acres that they're, they've got a garden. And of the eight, five of them were going down with a split rate. The three that were going up, one was going up, if you do a 7% adjustment, it was gonna go up $40 over what they would pay with a single rate. They have a, a commercial business on the farm that is not a traditional farm business. Another one has land that is being leased to a, a national corporation where the tax for that went up more than what their taxes would be going up for the year. And the tax for that land is just passed through to the tenant. And the third one was another farm that has a non-traditional farming business on it. And that was going up a couple of hundred dollars. But in general, people People that have landed chapter, their their values will go up or the taxes will go up, but they're paying six dollars an acre, it'll go up to six or six or seven dollars an acre, it'll go up to seven or eight dollars an acre. Somebody with a hundred acre farm will pay a hundred dollars more or a hundred acre parcel, but their house taxes will drop by 150. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. So in summary, I do support the split tax rate. I do, do want to draw attention that Dan and Linda uh, and the assessor board do support it. It's the first time they are supporting it and they don't do it lightly. And Linda and Dan are doing this based off of the numbers that they're seeing, um, which if you look at the last numbers Linda sent out, pretty clear that there is a, a recovery happening with receipts. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, let's open it back up to anybody in the public because this is a public hearing. Hi, David. Um, this is Lynn Gray from Pyramid Companies in Hampshire Mall. Um, I just, beyond what note we sent um, to the select board urging you to vote against the split tax rate, that once it's in place, there are no guarantees. The split tax rate doesn't remain in place for future votes and years, which would put a really um, great strain on commercial and small businesses in Hadley. Um, our primary concern is this split tax rate voted on um, as a temporary means of bridging this gap from hardship to recovery is really more long-term and creates a financial hardship for future years. Um, and I think that um, Amy Feiden said it best, our, our best intentions are to make good on decisions that we make now that are just temporary, but it, it's really hard to go back. So like I said, beyond the letter that we sent um, urging you against this, um, that's really all I wanted to add. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ritter, I saw your camera go on. Did you, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, I do. I was just curious, you know, relative to the services the town provides, like fire and uh, police, what percentages of, do the businesses take of that time? Because it seems like there's an inordinate amount of resources spent to the businesses that would warrant additional taxes to cover those uh, expenses since they're spending a lot of time policing the malls and taking people away and the ambulances and uh, fire departments showing up at these businesses. So I'm just curious, we have that information. Uh, I don't, but Lieutenant Cook, would you happen to know maybe just a ballpark idea? I, I don't know. I don't think I could put a number on it particularly, but uh, I think it's a fair assessment. What Mr. Ritter said is that a, a, a fair amount of resources for police, fire, and EMS are spent on Route 9. So if that's the case, and we're using a lot more of our resources there, it seems prudent to me that they would pay a higher percentage of taxes to cover those uh, expenses. They, they are about a square foot in, in relevance to the homeowner with the average house. 
they've been right along for the last, I don't know how many years, 50 years. That's why the industrial area and the commercial area was built the way it was. And I agree with Paul, you know, the small businesses are the ones that are going to get hurt the worst. And we can't really afford, although our revenues practically doubled from last year, we can't afford to lose one business right now with the economy the way it's going. All right, I saw Dan's hand up first and then Molly. So Dan, go ahead. Um, um, hold on. Yeah. Actually, yeah, Joyce is really waving at me. It's very important, whatever she's got. Joyce, go ahead. What do you what do you got? You gotta unmute though. <laughs> You're still muted. You're still muted. Unmute. Am I unmuted? There you go. Now we have you. Okay. So to add to Mitch Cook's um, thing is that when we did our ambulance review during the COVID, our requirement for Route 9 in businesses was down. Ambulances uh, runs were down. Um, so there were many things that were not up to where it was prior to COVID. Uh, we're just starting to pick up now as businesses have started to pick up now. Um, so we were down some uh, actually on the ambulance runs and as things of that nature because of uh, the lack of people coming out and doing Route 9 and being on Route 9. So there was a little bit of difference there over this past year on what we experienced uh, in that area. Um, my thoughts were, you know, um, on the half and half, and as I've asked people about this, everything is inflating. So we don't want to just keep going for it for everything to keep going up. Um, and you don't want to pass it on to the customer. Everybody is just starting to get back into the um, being normal again as much as we can. And yes, we have seen an increase in meals tax and, and we have seen an increase in, in hotel taxes, but that's good for us. It's good for business, but that doesn't negate what they have endured over this past year where everything hasn't been what it was. And as we went through the COVID period, our businesses supported our fire, our police, our town. They uh, contributed in any way which they could to everybody that was a part of this. Um, and I think they really did uh, be a part of our town. They're, they are a part of our town. And I don't think splitting the tax rate is a good thing for us at this point. I think we should keep it at an even keel people that I've talked to, homeowners, business people, everything seems to want to be on the, on the same level and not splitting the tax rate. I think that we knew last year that this was coming this year, and I think people should have prepared for it. People were not out of work all the time. We didn't have people that accessed our, um, the availability of getting um, some help with their rentals or whatever. We still had money in the coffers from that. Not many people tapped into that. People still worked, even if it was from home. So that, you know, I don't think there was really a lack of whatever in, in Hadley. And I think that that's the whole thing that we need to take a look at. Um, so I'm not in favor of splitting the tax rate. Uh, Dan, sorry to cut you off. I'll go back to you. No problem. Uh, I just want to answer one of the previous speakers questions about commercial and services. And one of the main reasons in the past that we haven't advocated for a split rate is that studies that have been done by American Farmland Trust, who the study is going to really be biased towards farmland and open space. The studies that they did indicated that commercial uses about 50 cents in services for every dollar that they pay in taxes. So even though they're using more police and more fire, they're also paying substantially more in taxes to cover that. The main reason why they use less than, than residential, which is about $1.15 for every dollar they pay, is that they don't put, put kids in schools. And that's our big expense. That's about half of our budget is the school department. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, Molly? Uh, thanks, David. Yeah, I guess, so I just wanted to say that um, 
for the 15 years that I was involved in town government, um, I never, ever supported a split tax rate. And I used to talk about a scenario where I could envision um, perhaps if there was an override on a table that maybe that was a time where we might want to look at doing something differently. But of course, you know, we, we never needed to go there. Um, but I changed my mind this year and listening to the presentation by the assessors, um, the treasurer, this is a very, very different set of circumstances. And I think for one year and one year only, it does make sense. Um, there was a somewhat artificial drop in the tax rate um, due to a town meeting vote last year. And I think when you look at the commercial community as a whole, what you're gonna find is that, I mean, there's no question that the mall and, and the hotels were, were harmed significantly. Um, some restaurants were harmed, others were harmed less. But there are people who have rental property for a living. They're, I mean, I'm a commercial business owner in town as well as a residential owner. So again, like other people who've spoken, half a dozen to one, six of the other to me. But I, I'm a little bit disappointed that maybe there isn't more data to take a really deeper dive into the actual impact to multiple segments of the commercial property. Um, and I think when you look at the residential side of it, what we do know for sure is that we have about a third of our population are seniors, and many of those seniors are on fixed income. I've been listening to John Muscovitz say that for years, um, and I believe that the vote that was taken at town meeting was the concern that people on a fixed income would be really harmed. Easy to say that you warn them, but yeah, they just got a social security cost of living increase and then turn around and got slapped with a 14 and a half percent or whatever it is, Medicare increase. So I'm far more concerned about the residents in town who don't have the ability to pass on any sort of unexpected increase. Um, and so for that reason, again, for one year only, I'm in favor of a split tax rate. And for Lynn Gray, I understand the concern, but I think that, you know, in large part, when Hadley has made a, a point of saying, we're going to undo this, it has been undone. Um, and I think that's evidenced by all the money that just went back into stabilization this year. Okay. Uh, uh, Molly. <clears throat> Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's a double ended sword, no matter which which side you're looking at it from, I guess. But uh, what uh, you're with the Amherst uh, Chamber of Commerce, what are the what do you hear from the business owners besides the ones that have came in against it? Where, where, where do they stand on? And, and what are what are their expectations now? John, I'll say that personally, I have not heard from any business owners who are overly concerned about it. I mean, again, obviously the mall, obviously the hotel, um, but there are other business owners who, who are doing okay as evidenced by the receipts that are coming in. And there are other business owners, depending on the nature of your business, um, where COVID may have had minimal impact. So that's why I say, I think you really need to take a look at the commercial um, enterprises, if you will, in totality and, and look at them more by sector and may be surprised to find out that many commercial business owners are going to be okay with not getting as much of a reduction um, in their taxes as they would under the um, single tax rate, right? Because my understanding is that taxes generally on commercial are going down due to the assessed values so what we're really talking about in many cases is they're just not gonna get as much of a reduced tax um, bite as they would if we stayed with the single. Uh, let me go to Jane, cause her hand's gonna fall off holding it up that long. And then uh, Randy also is waiting. So go ahead, Jane. Uh, you're muted, Jane. One of the things is the numbers that um, our town people have shown us are that all, all of the businesses are going to have a less tax payment this year than they did last year. It will just be not 
quite as less. They'll still always across the board pay less taxes than they did last year. Second is, it is my belief, but I am not sure that there are other parcels besides the People's Bank that have sold for higher prices than they have been assessed at. And third, I am definitely for the split tax rate because as Molly said, we have seniors who are on truly fixed incomes and it helps them somewhat. So on those grounds, and maybe Dan can talk to the other thing about sales. Um, Dan, did you wanna chime in on sales at all before I go to Randy? Yeah, I'll, I'll go real quick. There, there's basically four sales that took place in town. Uh, the, the prices are up. I mean, Paul's point, yeah, you could discount people's savings bank based on who bought it. But the other properties are not, we're not bought by a butters and they're going for double what we have it assessed for. In, in, at a minimum double of what we have them assessed for. So the commercial values are gonna be going up next year. There's no doubt in my mind. Some of the values will still be depressed like the hospitality industry, but in general, commercial values will be going back up to where they were last year. Okay, Randy, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that I find it interesting in all the time I've lived in this town, there's been a single tax rate. And after we have this COVID disaster, uh, there's talk of making it split. And sure, there are businesses that are doing well, and I, like others, have commercial and residential property in town. Um, I have Wildwood Barbecue in my backyard and one of the Parmar hotels to, to my side. And I can see that both of them are not doing very well compared to what they used to be doing. And to, to Paul Benjamin's point, those are the smaller businesses that are really going to be impacted by this. And it's just, you know, it seems to me like, uh, okay, we're down, give us a kick and let's see where we can go from there. And that's all I have to say. Linda, you had your hand up. Did you have something before I go to uh, Alexi? Linda, you're muted. Okay. Um... Yeah, I just, I wanna address what, uh, uh, about whether we're hitting businesses. Um, many of the businesses who are instinctively, as we all are instinctively in Hadley against split rate. Many of the businesses haven't even checked to see what the impact would actually be on their taxes this year. And some have been very surprised recently to realize um, that they're uh, taking a position against something or they're actually losing uh, they're actually decreasing their taxes by tens of thousands of dollars. There's been quite a drop to some of these businesses um, and what they will need to pay in taxes this coming year. That's the inequity that we're trying to deal with as households are paying more income. We are not going after, the intention is not to go after businesses to make up for anything. It's to um, re um, settle the inequities between the residences and the businesses until uh, it equalizes out. Um, Dan talked about how commercial will be back next year. We actually know that it, um, it, it, we know it's coming back. We know uh, in many ways that much of it is back already. The taxes are being assessed on January 1, 2021. So since then, we already know that there's been an increase in the assessment. For the ones that aren't doing as well, their assessments are down. So therefore, their taxes are down. So that is balancing out for the businesses that are doing well, their taxes will be greater because they're going to be taxed on a higher assessed value. Uh, for a business doing less well, they're going to be, um, just like when your house value is down, you will pay less in taxes. So that equity is already built into it. Um, I do wanna to mention too, in support for businesses, that um, there are other kinds of businesses in town. Not all businesses own real estate, first of all. Um, they're not all, um, some of the businesses are owning rental real estate. And so those businesses also have had, had di difficult times getting their units, um, their uh, houses rented out, making deals with tenants who have not been able to pay their rents as well. Um, 
those um, we think of, they think of themselves as business. That's how they make their money. However, they will be taxed at the residential uh, rate because um, it's based on the use of the property and not the fact whether they're a business or a residence. So those businesses are going to be impacted. Developers who are buying property and um, doing um, and putting up houses are hitting the construction costs um, for putting in new houses are higher than they have been before. And those businesses are, are going to be hit at the residential rate for the businesses that for the um, buildings they put up. Uh, there are um, uh, many of the businesses rent from larger businesses whose taxes are dropping significantly this year. It shouldn't, um, so the, the, those who rent um, um, and run their businesses are only going to be impacted by the residential rate because most of, many of them live here in Hadley um, or they operate a business out of their home. So there's other businesses to consider is my point there. Probably the best argument I've heard is this general one on, um, it's a slippery slope generally, um, that once we start, we're not going to go back I'm not really concerned about that. There's memories are long in this town. Look how we heard every single year about that. What about the stabilization? Well, we need it one more time. We need it one more time. And as soon as the town had some extra cash, which it did this past year, we paid it back and then some. We paid back more than what we borrowed and it's in there. Um, if it's important to the town and if it's important to the businesses, they're not gonna let you forget about it. Finance committee is not gonna let you forget about it. Um, I don't think any of us are going to forget it. So um, I think it's our intention to go back and I think that's what we're gonna do. Okay, uh, Alexi. You're muted, Alexi. Thank you. Um, I think there's good arguments arguing both ways. I really do. Uh, but I come down on the side of uh, one tax rate. Uh, it just seems like kicking the businesses when they're down, even if their actual tax rate doesn't go up, doesn't go up. Uh, they're going to have a lot less money this year, at least the ones who didn't do very well. And um, as far as the uh, relative use of town services, it seems like commercial property is more valuable. So they're gonna be paying more taxes anyway. Um, and we're the undisputed champions of low taxes already in the whole region, uh, paying a little bit more. I think you get a lot more bang for your buck by keeping one tax rate where everyone pays a little more rather than saddling uh, a big increase on the, the businesses. Um, and the whole Pandora's box problem of, of once we do it, it's harder to not do it. I, I do worry about that. Uh, the very fact that we're doing this now, last year we said taxes were gonna go up and it seems like we're unable to follow through with that. So that makes me worry about the future with doing this. That's all I have to say. Okay. There's, there's one other statistic that I got from Dan, which is there are approximately 1,800 units in residential areas that would be taxed and 360 in commercial and open space that would be included in the commercial tax. So in terms of the number of people we are actually impacting, the residential homeowners, if we don't do the split tax, are a much larger number of our population. Okay. Um, any last call for public comments before we move to close the hearing and then we have to decide what we're going to do. Dan? I just wanna say one last thing and that not all commercial, industrial and personal property tax bills are going down this year. If there's a single rate or a split rate, the values are, are different, vastly different year to year uh, industry to industry, just because the, the rate went down doesn't mean necessarily that the commercial tax bill is going down or the values drop doesn't mean the, the tax bill is going down. And if you split the rate, some, some businesses will pay more. They're not going to pay a, a substantial amount more, but they'll pay more than they paid last year. And they'll probably pay equal to what they paid two years ago. But I just want people to know that 
if you go with a single rate or a split rate, there still will be some commercial that will pay more and pretty much all residential is gonna pay more if you go with a single rate or a split rate. Okay, last call for public comments on this. If I could get a motion to close the uh, tax classification hearing, please, and then we'll decide. So moved. All right. Second. Motion by Amy, second by Jane. Any discussion on closing the hearing? Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call to Phil. Yes. Devin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So the hearing is closed. Thank you everyone from the public that showed up to voice their comments. Um, so what I'd like to do for this to try to make it as simple as possible, so we don't usually, so we don't get into the mess we normally get in. If we could get a motion one way or another, um, keeping a single rate or splitting the rate, and then we can go into the discussion because if we vote to keep a single rate, obviously we don't need to discuss how much we're going to shift the rate. But if we vote to, to split the rate, then we can open that discussion about how much we want to shift it. And that may take a little bit of longer to decide. So if I could get a motion one way or another to split rate versus uh, single rate. I'll make um, a, motion a motion to, to not to split the rate. Okay, got a motion by Joyce to keep a single rate. Need a second from somebody or not? Yeah, second. All right, second by John. And any discussion on this topic? No discussion. Okay. Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote. Phil? No. Nevin Smith? No. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? No. That's two two. All right. So, uh, Dan, do we need another motion just to make it clear that we're going to vote to split the tax rate, or is that you know by default make it clear that we're going to split the rate? Yeah, DOR is pretty much a stickler with how these things are are done. So once you decide what you want to do for a a split, I can give you the exact figure that you're going to need to include in the motion. Okay. All right, so now, uh, now we need your expertise, Dan, as far as the rate shift, because obviously we have a big selection of how the rate will shift. Um, do you have any of your slides or anything that you can share as far as how, you know, what our options are and what the effect will be? The presentations that I've had have been a 7%, a 10%, and a 12%, where my board has not voted on a rate my opinion was they were leaning towards the seven percent rather than the ten percent and it can be any figure that you you want to use do you uh, do you have that slide available or does uh jennifer maybe you have that available from last time oh uh, she's trying to find it let's see if i've got Uh, this was the, these are in 5% increments. Actually, let me go to a different screen. Options table, here we go. Share this one. Uh, this one has the, the commercial shift in the far left column. If you want to go with a 101, it would be a 0.9956 residential factor. And that works out to uh, a commercial, a residential rate of 252 and a commercial rate of 1270. So 7% that we had in the slide is this line right here. That is a 1218 rate for residential and a 1345 for commercial. 
can you squish those columns just so I can see the um, the actual dollar amount or, or the actual rates for residential and commercial next to the shift percentages on the far left side? I don't want to mess up your whole. I should be page. able to do this. Uh... It's hard enough to follow it when I'm controlling the mouse versus other people. <laughs> There we go. So here's, whoops, I missed one. Let's go back and start here. Okay, so here's the, in the, the far left column here, this is the, the percentage shift for commercial. So 1% shift would be a 1252 tax rate, it would go down by five cents and commercial would go up by uh, 13 cents. And that's pretty much gonna continue as you, you jump it up. The 102 it would be a 1246 residential rate and a 1282 commercial rate. And then you're probably looking more in these in this range right here that's highlighted, something between the 2% and the 10% shift. Yeah, the 2% is what I asked you about our last meeting, Dan. Yeah, if there's a 2% shift, the tax rate would drop by 11 cents. And so the average bill would go down uh, about 40 bucks. That's for residential? For or residential. Okay. And then commercial, uh, it's really difficult to determine the average commercial value, but it would basically, the tax bill would go up about 2% from a single rate. And for 7%, what would the difference be for residential overall tax bill? Uh, 7%, it is. Where the average bill would go down about $143. Down or less of an increase? Because I know initially we were talking about a $400 it, increase. It would be less of an increase. It okay. would the average bill would go up $266. All right. Yeah, those, that should not that clear that we're not actually. Yeah, that that's about a double what the normal increase would be. Okay. So if we <clears throat> So personally, I'm kind of looking between the seven, eight, nine range, but this is just me here. But um, what, how much of an increase would the average household see under each of those rates if we were to uh, over last year? Uh, seven percent would be about two sixty-five. Okay. Yeah, for eight percent would be a two forty eight okay. increase, and nine percent would be about two twenty six. Okay. So just to make it clear, by doing this, people are still going to see an increase of some sort, unless we went real crazy and went down the other end of the scale, which I don't think that's what we're talking about here. But people will see an increase. It just won't be on residential. It just won't be as much as if we left it in the single rate. I think the 7% which Dan is saying that he recommends and um, makes more sense than going up too much on the rate for commercial. It's a, it's a good balance. And I think another thing Dan said to me is nobody's going to be happy. Commercial's not going to be happy. Residential's not going to be happy because their taxes are going up regardless because of the loss of income from commercial. So that's 
almost like a good solution because we're not siding with one side or the other. That's what I was thinking as well. Yeah. So, yeah. But... so can I make a motion then? Sure. So I move for the split tax rate um, opt for a 7%. I'll second that. Okay, motion by Amy, second by Jane. Dan, do you have the language that I need to read? Can you? Yeah, you would uh, move that the town vote to adopt a residential factor of 0 0.9690. And that you grant no open space discount, no residential exemption, and no small commercial exemption. Okay. Uh, Amy, can I have you withdraw your motion and then move to do that just so that way we're, we're um, all good for DOR? Withdrawn. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, Dan, could you reread that one more time? Sorry. Uh, to move that the town vote to adopt a residential factor of 0 0.9690 for FY22 and that the town vote to grant no open space discount, no residential exemption, and no small commercial exemption. Just need that. Amy, are you going to move that? Um, I was actually just writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> you can just say so moved. He read it for you. So moved. All right. Second. All right. Motion by Amy, second by Jane. Any other discussion on the 7% shift? All right. Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? No. Wiskevitz? No. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, just want to say thank you to Dan, the assessors, Linda, um, Carolyn, and also finance for, um, even though we didn't end up siding with finance, thanks for all the, the input discussion. And I know Linda and Dan have been going crazy with spreadsheets. So I appreciate all the time spent <clears throat> with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's not an easy thing to do. And like they said, not everyone's gonna be happy. Okay, well, thank you. Let's move on to um, consent agenda. We have warrants AP 2219, AP 2219S, AP 2220, AP 2220S. We have an application by a farmer winery for license to sell at a farmer's market, home fruit wine, Lori Perkins and David LeClaire. So move. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Uh, any discussion on that? Jennifer? I was just gonna let you know that I do believe Lori Perkins is here if y'all had any questions for her. I don't, but after we uh, go through it, if she wanted to say something, she could. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Okay. No, that, that's fine. Jennifer, do you want to roll call? Roll call vote. Uh, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yeah. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lori, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the winery? She might have left. Okay. Hi. Oh, oh, she... Hello. Oh, there she is. She's here. Takes a minute to get it unmuted. That's OK. Um, hi, everyone. Just wanted to introduce myself. Um, we have a home fruit wine in Orange Mass. We've been in business for six years now. We've been selling at the Amherst Farmers Market and the Springfield Farmers Market in, uh, throughout the summer season. And um, we've been doing pretty well there and we've had the opportunity to try to sell at the winter one. So um, we're here tonight to ask for your permission and I thank you all for voting us to do so. And we look forward to a nice holiday season. All right, thank you. Do you have any questions for us? Nope, good luck to you. And um, we should probably use a, one, a bottle of wine right now. 
<laughs> After all that, yeah, I said all that. We're just getting started, Joyce. <laughs> uh, I ate my dinner while you were in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. You're over. And where are you located right now? Are you back in the Hampshire Mall this right now, or where are you? We're the last uh, market this Saturday in Amherst. And then um, Tuesday will be our last uh, market in Springfield. So we won't okay. be starting, and you know, we have a couple of weeks off, and then we'll be starting in Hadley. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, and have a nice evening, everyone. You, you also. All right, um, we'll do public comments next, 4.1 on the agenda. Uh, limit this to 15 minutes and please limit your comments to three minutes each so that way others may have a chance to comment. If you're here for public comments, turn on your camera and wave at us. All right, last call for public comments. Okay, that was quick. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit because I know uh, we have some people waiting for some specific items. So, uh, Lieutenant Cook, you're here for Old Mountain Road, I believe, uh, correct? That's correct. All right. Tell us about Old Mountain Road. So, uh, earlier this month or late in October, we received uh, received a notification from State 911 that there was a question as to the proper naming of Old Mountain and Mountain Road. So... Uh, I began investigating to try to determine uh, what the proper naming of the roads was. And uh, up until this point, it was our understanding that the paved portion of Mountain Road that goes up to the Skinner Gate was named Mountain Road and that the dirt portion that comes up uh, from Hockenham Road at the South Hadley Town Line was Old Mountain Road. So I began to do some digging. I uh, looked at our street listing. We had Old Mountain Road listi listed. And then I went and spoke with Dan Zadonik and Janice Kangas in the assessor's office. And what we learned was that at a special town meeting in the 90s, there was a vote to change the entirety of the road um, to either Old Mountain or Mountain Road. I believe it was changed strictly to Mountain Road. When you looked at State 911, when you, when you looked at Google, when you looked at the town street listing, when you looked at town maps, everything was different. So uh, what we found was that legally the road should have been changed in the 90s to everything being Mountain Road. So we found that there were some logistical issues to that if the entirety of the name is Mountain Road. So what the street names should be would be how they how we believe that they are right now. Old Mountain Road being the dirt portion and Mountain Road being the paved portion going up to the Skinner Gate. And we believe that for the, uh, for the reasons, for the purposes of public safety, that uh, if we are seeking a mutual aid assistance from another police department or another fire department, another ambulance service, we would like for them to be able to go um, and, and have the roads be posted appropriately. And the other issue is that you have Old Mountain Road that is a one-way street, and then you have Mountain Road, the paved portion of Mountain Road, a two-way street. So if we have one continuous street with one street name, then that could potentially add confusion to those that may be responding to the area. So it's with that that we believe that the roads should be uh, legally posted and named as they appear to be now. Okay. So what do we have to do? Mitch, did you check with the deeds office or anything about the old county road map? Uh, and, and are they still separate there or not? So there is a section of road that goes up to the gate that is, uh, that is not town road. 
so there's also there's also that gap in, in between the roads as well. But with regards to with regards to the assessors maps, each one of those uh, the homes that are on mountain and old mountain are all listed as mountain road on everybody's deed all the residences well we actually have a uh, old mountain road resident here mr ritter is <laughs> i figure i'll let you chime in since you're here and you live there sure so this shouldn't be a huge controversy but there are still a lot of issues with deliveries on this street because they have a hard time to differentiating between the two mount, old mountain roads. We still see a lot of traffic going the wrong way on old mountain road. Under Google Maps, it's both roads are still listed as old mountain roads. So if we make the changes that you're suggesting, will that somehow magically be changed in the uh, GIS system so that the Google Maps will not call both streets the same? Um, and in addition to that, I think if uh, we need a speed limit sign on this road too, because it's still used as a byway or a, a cross path. So for all those issues be resolved, if we re revert back to what we've always called, called this dirt road, old mountain road, because it seems to be an issue for some of the delivery folks. And I'd like to make sure that whatever change you make is gonna be very clear and not confuse them more. Uh, I'm all in favor. I'm all in favor of old mountain road and mountain road, because I think that's the way we've always called it since before this was called the uh, Barris Road. So I know with Apple Maps and whatever else, I'm not sure about Google Maps, I'm an Apple guy, but um, you know, you can, once we make this change and we get the street signs up, you can submit a uh, error report, so to speak, where they, where they will go and update the map. Sometimes it takes <laughs> several months, but you could say, hey, look, the street sign shows Old Mountain Road, you need to change it on Apple Maps, Google Maps, whatever. Um, it is somewhat crowdsourced like that. So I think that's something we could, we could do once we get the correct signs in place. Unfortunately, a lot of out-of-state people are relying on their uh, GIS or their, or their map system sends them in the wrong direction on the street. And I'm not sure why that is. And that might be because the paved part is two-way and this unpaved part is not. So I want to see if we can get that somehow other corrected and all in favor of changing the names to two separate streets. Lieutenant Cook, how long does it take for the state 911 database to get updated? Is that pretty quick? It, I think as soon as we notify them of what the actual names are, they will change that in the 911 map. Uh, with regards to correcting it in Google and all the other privately sourced maps, I think that you're correct in that we're gonna have to ask them to change them. Um, you know, with regards to our town listings, I believe that um, I believe that this would have to go back to a special town meeting or a town meeting in order to change it because it was changed at a special town meeting. But that's for you folks to decide. But it would have to then be updated in uh, street listings and in the town GIS map and, and so on and so forth. Dan, you had something? Yeah, when when we update our, our GIS map, it goes to Mass GIS, which is where everybody else gets their copies. So as soon as it's updated at Mass GIS, which would probably be in the spring, uh, everybody else would update as soon as they update through that, through Mass GIS. Okay. So what do we need tonight? We just need a motion to rename the paved portion Mountain Road and dirt portion Old Mountain Road. And then we also need to make a motion to can you, replace can the you, missing. Can you hear me on the comment? Hello. Uh, hang on, sir. I, uh, Amy, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say we also need to. Um, Chris was looking for permission to replace the missing mountain road sign as well. And then also, is there? Um, I should ask Mr. Ritter, is there a, a one way sign there for when it goes to the dirt road portion so that people know not to? go both directions well that's an interesting question there used to be one way do not enter signs up where the pavement ends and those have been taken down because the trees were taken down there are uh, wrong way signs about halfway down the road by the trailhead that says you're going the wrong way once you're halfway down it there is a one way sign at the end next to a stop sign that actually is going in the opposite direction so it's confusing to a lot of people so 
there really is no one way sign up by the paved area anymore and that should be the place. I, I'm okay, a, so when we make this motion to replace the missing mountain road sign on the paved portion, then we should probably also add necessary signage for proper travel to it. Sounds good to me. I believe my neighbor, Mr. McGee, is the one on the phone as well. Oh, okay. I think right. maybe eight years ago or so, uh, the board voted to make that. I'm un I'm unmuted now. Hello. Hang on, Mr. McGee. Wait a minute. Hang on one second. Okay. No, go ahead. Let him talk. I'll 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 finish up after. All right. Go ahead, sir. I'm I'm we're residents of Old Mountain Road, and we of course want to continue. Old Mountain Road on the dirt road, which was built as a historic road built by the WPA. Okay. One of the things that we seem to have a question about is when you come off Route 47 and head up to the state park, the road goes and has the state park on both sides of the road. And there's a sign there that says town road ends. Now, Now, Skinner State Park lists their address as 10 Skinner State Park Road. And that's from the sign coming up to the entrance to the park. And they give an address in Hadley. Now, when the mail comes to the post office in Hadley, it is placed in a post office box because they don't deliver to a, a, a postal box at the entrance of the park. So there is some confusion because the maintenance of that road from the park entrance going down to 47 on the paved road that was repaved by the state, was repaved by the state. What impact does that have on that the town is maintaining that it's mountain road up to the park entrance? Because this is a state, it's the state that repaved it down to where the town road ends. Because it's a state park. So they did that as part of the uh, park and rec area of the, uh, you know, the state, whatever they do for their park and rec uh, departments. So that's probably why they did that. Someone so that it's, 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 is it a state road from where the sign says town road ends on Mountain, on Mountain Road? I would think it would be because they, they're the ones that have deemed it a, you know, net, you know, state park. Um, so, and they were the ones that paved it. So I would assume that it was their responsibility. Well, their repaving of the road create a safety has it in that they interfered when they did their overlayment. They didn't put in a new road, which mm -hmm. interfered with the drainage right where the state sign, where the sign says end of town road, the drainage to bring the water underneath the road and away because right now in the winter time, it creates a sheet of ice on that curve coming down on that mm -hmm. paved road mm -hmm. we can we can certainly look so at would, uh, would, would someone uh, take a look at that because in the maintenance the state says that old mountain road is a gravel road on their on their uh, publication so there's confusion and the state lists the address as 10 skinner state park road in hadley but in another section, they listed as 10 Skinner State Park Road, Amherst. So apparently the state uh, can, is not paying close attention to what's out on the Google Maps and what is people, because the people that are coming on the dirt road to use the trail are license plates of New York, Connecticut, and other, other states. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you, the know the, road, you know, you know, the they're state. blocking, they're blocking 
they're blocking emergency vehicles using that because these people park and then go on the trail because it's an hour walk up to the summit. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we can we can certainly look at some more of that uh, down the line. But, what we but, to return, but to return to the original notification we received from the select board, uh, we are in agreement with our neighbor Ritter that the dirt road should have the name Old Mountain Road. Okay. I don't know what it's named. Go ahead. All right. So I guess what we need is a motion to that effect. And then uh, what was the other part, Amy, that I missed? So um, we need Chris or the DPW to replace the missing Mountain Road sign on the paved portion because um, he needs our permission for that. And then also um, making sure that there's um, additional signage for one way, do not enter, wrong way, all of, you know, whatever we need to do for that. So are you making that motion? Um, yes. Second. second. <laughs> motion by Amy, second by Jane. Uh, any other discussion from the select board on this issue? John, did you want to, you had something or are you good with that? Yeah, like I said, I believe the board voted to make that a one-way road quite some time ago. Uh, I don't know exactly why. Uh, I think it was because of the people parking on the side. And it was a safety hazard along with the police department. I'm going to say it was eight years ago. We, the board voted one way, but uh, yeah, as, we did, John. Yeah. yeah. That's because that may be because that the road is 25 feet, 10 inches wide. Yeah. If you go back and look at your historic records and perhaps you contact the town historian that can resolve that. Great. I'll be glad to do that. That, road, that road's a terrible road to maintain in the wintertime. Some of the guys don't even want to plow it. I've been up there myself to plow yep. it. And, uh, but we have to because there's residents living there. Uh, we got to make it accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. As far as the state on the tar side, I believe they stopped at the town road ends here, and they do own a portion of that tarred part of the road. But I think it was an agreement that they were going to pay as far as they could. And whether you want to call it a donation or an improvement to the town road, where, wherever they ended up, wherever they spent paving to. And we are still responsible for paving wherever our, our residents live. So that's what we do. All right. Jennifer, could you do roll Thank call? you. Can I please ask for the repeating of the, the motion? I missed the for, first part of it. I got the replace mountain road sign and the additional signage is needed, but I missed the first part of Amy's motion. You're muted, Amy. Oh my God, I wasn't gonna be one of those people today that didn't unmute themselves, but here I am, foot in mouth. Um, so that, we changed the legal name of the dirt portion of Mountain Road, which everyone's already calling Old Mountain Road, to Old Mountain Road. Okay. The sign is up there now that says Old Mountain Road, and perhaps you can put the sign at the park entrance to Old Mountain Road. All right, sir, I gotta have you just hang on. We need to get this straight as far as the motion goes. So Amy, was that all of it? Yeah, so it's... Um, legally changing um the change the legal name of the dirt portion of mountain road to old back to old mountain road um and then that was it just to have like the two separate i'm okay. actually reading the email and then the one-way signs as well right yep and then also the missing mountain road sign on the paved portion okay thank you i'm ready to roll call now all right so that was by amy and second by was it Jane or Joyce that second that Jane did? I, okay. I, I don't care. <laughs> All right, Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Uh, David, maybe uh, Randy has got a little input on this also, possibly. All right, after we're done with the vote, we can go back. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, Randy, you have something?
Yes, uh, about two things. The state does believe they own a portion of Mountain Road. There have been uh, at least one client of mine try to build a house on the downhill side of that above where uh, it says Town Road ends here and the state is vehemently against it. Uh, and then number two, if I heard someone say that town meeting voted to change the name of the road. So don't we have to go back to town meeting in order to do that? I assume we do, do and I was going to make a motion that we put this on the spring warrant. Okay, I can, that makes sense to me and that would yeah. be good. Maybe, uh, maybe Bill, uh, I know Bill's pretty good at looking that stuff up in the, uh, office in Northampton there. I don't know if he's still on, if he'd be interested in researching this a little bit more with Mitch and uh, maybe even you, Randy, you know a little bit about the property lines of the road, so. I'll be happy to help. Okay, but in the meantime- Wait, we was it, hold on, sorry, I, I'm so sorry. Was it the town meeting that chose to make it a one way or was it the town meeting that chose to change the names? Town meeting was to change the name. The one way was the board had just voted on one way. Okay. And I think that was our, our authority at the time. So yeah, we, we do traffic stuff like speed limits and one ways, things like that. So, okay. so I think somebody needs to make a motion to put it on town meeting warrant for the spring. So, so I have to withdraw my motion. So withdrawn. No. I mean, it, it's already been passed and uh, we got to put up the one way signs at, at this point anyway, so we'll certainly put it on the town meeting warrant, but until we, uh, my feeling is until we know for a fact we need to go back to town meeting, we should at least get the correct signs up and God. get it taken care of. And then if we need to go yeah. back to town meeting, we can, we can vote out and in the uh, spring, I guess it would be. Make a motion to vote on, on the town now. spring meeting. <laughs> All right, Joyce got the motion, and I need a second. Second. Second by Jane. Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Parsons? <clears throat> yeah. I just feel like we could have been able to do this all tonight if it was something that the, the public safety came up with, but OK. Yep. Okay, so, so that's all set. And uh, Lieutenant, Cook, uh, Lieutenant Cook, sorry that took so long, but you're also here for uh, speed speed limit on Meadow Street, right? So I'll let you get that too. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, before I move on to Meadow Street, I just want to make sure on the old mountain road stuff before we get too far past it so there's not confusion. If the town is going to be changing and putting up the correct legal street signs. In the meantime, what that means is that the old, the, the street sign that is currently showing is Old Mountain Road should essentially come down and be changed to Mountain Road. And then the Mountain Road sign that's missing be re replaced. So I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page that if if you're going to go down the road of making it as it stands legally now up until town meeting, that that's what that would entail. So we have to and take by, down a sign that's already there. But I think that that's going to add confusion. I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page with regards oh to that. God, this is so stupid. Okay. My, my feeling is we <laughs> put the sign up for Old Mountain Road on the gravel portion, Mountain Road on the paved portion, get the correct one-way signage up and uh, get it straight with the state 911 and then we can do some more research on whether this needs to go back to town meeting or not. And if so, then we'll vote out it in the spring. But in the meantime, we need to get the, the traffic flow right and get it right for the residents that live on there. Beautiful. Thank you. So, is the rest of the board okay oh. with that, at least as an interim measure? Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay. When nothing gets done in politics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now uh, let's go on to Meadow Street. <laughs> Yes, Meadow Street. So uh, early last week, 
I received uh, a compl- I received an email from a resident of Meadow Street, and then we also received another email through the town website relative to speeding complaints on Meadow Street. Uh, fortunately, we have the ability and the technology to be able to bring one of our trailers up and uh, really dig down as to what uh, some of these issues and and uh, and and where they come from. So I was able to bring one of our signs up there to see what the speeds are like. Uh, but the first thing that I noticed when I went up there is, is that the speed limit is posted as a 25 mile per hour zone. And uh, just in comparison, uh, the, uh, the, the curves by Hartsbrook School on Bay Road um, is, a, is a posted 25 mile per hour zone. Um, you know, Rocky Hill Road is, uh, is a 30 mile per hour zone and there's a pretty sharp curve on that street. In comparison, Meadow Street is essentially is is barely capable of accommodating two vehicles passing each other, and uh, and the curve on the River Drive side is, is significantly sharp, and, and you really can't navigate it safely at 25 mile 25 miles per hour. So uh, the sign has been out there for approximately a week, and prior to the meeting starting, I went through and looked to see what the speeds were looking like. And the average speed on Meadow Street is a whopping 13 miles per hour. And the 85th percentile of speed is 14 miles per hour. Now, that doesn't sound that significant, but in comparison, (laughs) some of the high speed alerts that I'm seeing are through the 30 mile per hour range on that street, um, which is pretty significant. So it is with that information that, uh, that we believe that the speed limit should be, uh, should be 15 miles per hour on the street and, and, and specifically one of the residents even requested that particular speed limit. So moved. All right, motion by Amy, second, second. by Jane. Yep, second by Jane. Any other discussion on 15 miles an hour? Yeah, I, I, I actually have another street that we could take a look at would be uh, Spruce Hill Road, which seems to be quite the cut through uh, from Rocky Hill getting to Route 9. Um, I'm not sure what that's posted, but if if you could, Mitch, look at that um, and just to see what the actual speed limit is on that route also. Um, That is also a very tight street for two cars passing one another. Um, it's kind of a hard, hard thing. So um, if that could be possible, I'd appreciate it. Okay. That's all I have and I'll vote yes. All right, Jennifer Roll Call. Roll Call Hill? Yes. Devin Smith? Yes. Chung Lai? Yes. Miskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, and Lieutenant Cook, before I let you go, I'm going to hit uh, Middle Street, right turn only lane, just in case you want to chime in on anything. Uh, I talked to the chief, but in case you have anything different on the traffic. Um, Jennifer, can you share that graphic on the screen for the people that are watching from home? This is 6.7 on the agenda. Um, So intersection of Route 9 and Middle Street, a resident brought up to me the idea that since we removed the no turn on red signs, uh, Lieutenant Cook can correct me if I'm wrong, but we haven't had any major traffic accidents or issues there. It seems to be working pretty well. The problem is that, let's just say, when you're heading south, which is from the top of the screen towards the bottom on Middle Street, uh, that right-hand lane is the going straight across as well as the right-hand turn lane. So you'll have one person that's at the front of the line trying to go straight and holding up the whole line of people that are trying to get from UMass and uh, the opposite is true. Um, same thing on the other side, heading north on Middle Street. Obviously, it doesn't apply to east and west on Route 9 because those no turn on red signs are still there. Um, so I reached out to MassDOT and asked the gentleman that's in charge of um, this type of stuff what our options were. And Jennifer, can you put the next one up with my, my scribbles on it? So they are willing to consider doing something like this and heading south on middle street making a right hand turn on route nine uh they are considering putting a green arrow there so you can always make that right hand turn without stopping um 
because eastbound traffic heading towards Amherst has its own light time separately from traffic heading westbound. So traffic heading eastbound toward Amherst can go while there's a green arrow turning right onto Route 9. So they seem to like the idea. Um, they didn't foresee any issues. They said it can't possibly happen until the spring because they can't, they don't have the, the bandwidth to do any more traffic marking or anything like that this, this, uh, this year because they're so backed up. But uh, he said it would be best if the select board could vote on this and uh, submit a letter of support so that way they had something to work with. So I don't know, Lieutenant Cook, do you have anything to chime in on accidents or any, any of the issues here? No, nothing to chime in with regards to accidents, but I would just say that uh, <clears throat> that if the um, if Mass DOT is willing to do some type of traffic count and that the counts uh, support that uh, that this type of change is beneficial to traffic flow, then we're all for it. Okay. <clears throat> David, I think I heard you say that there would be a right arrow heading south on Middle Street. There would be a right turn arrow that would always be green. I think that's a mistake. It should turn red when there's traffic headed towards Northampton. Yes, there, there, it would not always be green. That, that was my okay. mistake. I said Thank that. You. When the traffic is heading toward Amherst, they go first where traffic is turning left, going north on Middle Street and heading straight across. That's when it would be green. And then it would turn red when the traffic heading toward Northampton goes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, I, so I've been in all those lanes hundreds of times already. And the problem that I run into is if you're taking a left turn going north and the people are coming out taking a right turn going south, the light is so short, you've got two or three cars sitting in that intersection and they're waiting for the people turning right. They're not using both lanes on Route 9 when they're turning. Same thing on the north side, I mean on the south side. They're, they're turning across, they're turning into each other, and there could be three or four cars in that intersection right now, the way it's set up, and they're, they're waiting for that other lane to turn in. Maybe they should make they're north not south both lanes. They're not utilizing both lanes on Route Nine when they're God. So, I, I wouldn't this alleviate it because the people that are going straight or turning right, the people turning right wouldn't have to wait for anyone that has to go straight because you'd be changing the left turn only to a straight and left. But I think if they could make it so that just like eastbound traffic goes, westbound traffic goes, northbound should have its own light and southbound should have its own light and then you don't have any of those problems. That so, light is long enough as is though. No, it's not. No, so, I drive through there a lot. That's what I'm trying to say. There's, there's cars, there's three to four cars sitting in that intersection when the light changes for the uh, westbound traffic going east. Uh, to get the light. So I, I did ask about the length of time that the lights are green. And he said that they could not change that because their primary concern is traffic flow on Route 9. I did not ask about, you know, whether they could alternate north first or south first or whatever and give them a chance. But I'm, I'm guessing it's because they want to keep it short so they can keep people moving on Route 9 and not backing up. But yeah, just to get I, you, I, I can I ask. Think Mitch's idea is a good one of getting an actual count coming north and coming south at that intersection to see see what kind of vehicle uh, numbers we got. So. Well, they have a whole uh, traffic engineering department that I'm sure will be happy to do all that. So, uh, Lieutenant Cook? So I think that uh, potentially splitting and having uh, northbound and southbound having uh, their own cycle is a start and i think that uh, a perfect example of that working is right up the street here in the center of sunderland although it's kind of a, a hybrid of the both in that the traffic the northbound traffic here at the intersection of 47 and 116 gets the green light with a green arrow first for a period of time and then the opposite side then gets the green light so i think that um that would be something that 
would also benefit uh, the traffic pattern as well. Okay. And then Dan and Sue, real quick, please. Uh, leaving Town Hall during UMass evening rush, there are a lot of times that if you're in that left turn only lane to go towards Northampton, you can't make it through. The traffic queues up really far. I think if that's changed to left and straight, it's going to back up past Maple Street during the evening rush. Okay. If people aren't allowed to go straight. Sue? Yeah, if you go back to the original uh, discussion about this, I think the right turn only was intended to be off of Route 9 only, not middle street onto route nine um <laughs> so i think yeah that I makes was, more sense yeah i was the one that actually made the, the comment about turning off of route nine to alleviate the traffic that was turning i remember john yeah. and that's and then and then mass dot came in and put in the right turn only off of middle street onto yeah. route nine, which yeah. I think was a, a foobar. <laughs> well, they, they won't approve the other one. I asked them again about that again. Uh, they said the sight lines aren't there. So unless we want to uh, remove some building, uh, they said that there's no way that they can approve <laughs> it. Um, Duncan there with the northbound sight lines and whatever's blocked, probably town hall blocking it or something from the other way. Uh, so let's just get a traffic count and then go from there. Does that work? Can we do that? All right. So I guess uh, could I get a motion, something along the lines of supporting investigating this further and see what Mass DOT comes up with? So moved. Second. All right. Motion by Amy, second by Joyce. Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Muscovitz. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right, Lieutenant Cook, thank you. Sorry to keep you so long. No worries. Thank you all. Have a good night. Um, I'm going to jump down to, uh, we'll go down to Haley, I think is here, waiting on the tax work off update. She's been here a long time. So do you want to introduce us to this? Sure. Thank you. Um, so it's that time of year again to approve the senior and veterans tax work off programs. And this year um, it's been recommended, I think by the finance committee, Dan um, Zadonic, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we're recommending doubling the, the potential abatement for both seniors and veterans who might participate in this program partly in an effort to attract more people, more takers. Um, the various documents to update this have been provided in board docs. Um, I, and it's what you would be committing to if you agreed to double the abatement from 500 to $1,000 is, you know, setting aside a maximum of you know, $5,000 of foregone tax income. But there's no, there's little likelihood, I will say that five people will use this, um, but they could and maybe they should be encouraged to. Um, so all the documents describe the, the guidelines, the application process um, and the job descriptions that department heads have prepared for the year. Hey, wait, how many? How many people are currently taking advantage of this program? One. So it's not a big loss of money for us. And perhaps the increased amount will make it more interesting for people who need the income because it is a low income support for seniors and veterans. Yeah, I think it's definitely fair to say that doubling the abatement potential should make it more attractive to a larger number of people. I move we accept this. Second. 
All right, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any discussion on that? Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Amy. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Haley. And then we will go, I know Jim Shea has been here for a long time. So Jim Shea, do you want to talk about the North Hadley Fire substation and softball fields? Hi, how are you all? Good. Good. Um, so while I'm on here, I just wanted to uh, take a quick minute to introduce uh, you all to um, Greg, who is our new um, Park and Rec Director. He moved out here from uh, Pueblo, Colorado um, with his wife and child to take this job. Um, he came from a place that uh, he was managing a, uh, a baseball complex out there for the county. And he's also got a lot of other really relevant experience uh, that I think is going to be extremely beneficial to the Park and Rec program. So I just wanted to introduce you guys all to him and uh, his camera's off and his microphone's off. So uh, that seems to be working out perfectly. <laughs> hey guys. He's there. Hey. <laughs> there he is. I think he's got some brand with you. Oh, can you guys hear me? All right, well that went swimmingly. Um, but that's Greg. Um, so the reason I'm here is to ask for your per, uh, permission to uh, use the land adjacent. On, if you're looking, okay. standing in the road, looking at um, the North Hadley Fire Substation uh, to the left of it for a softball field for the Hadley girls um, teams. They have absolutely no place to call their own at this point. Um, every year they have to come to Cal Ripken um, and ask for time for practicing, for um, games, for all this stuff. And, and I, you know, I was talking to a couple people that were involved with the softball program and I just basically feel that that's not right. They don't have a place of their own. They have to ask other people for field time. And if we had the um, space available that we could use that for them and build them a place that they can call home. Um, because as it is, they get the less desirable times because it's the um, Cal Ripken families that go out and maintain those fields and keep them up to date. The Cal Ripken board that's currently going out there and putting in new um, dugouts and whatnot. So I, I just feel like it would be nice for the girls to have a place that they could call their own and be proud of. And so I have gone a couple of different ways and uh, I'm not going to be asking the town for any money for this. Um, I just need the land and I'm going to try and get it done a different way. And I was hoping that maybe you folks would all support this. And I think Greg's stuff is working so he can probably wave and say hi now. Hey guys, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Oh, well. um, I believe when I was there last, you showed me blueprints that already yes. existed. Yes, this is a plan that actually somebody, before I was even on uh, the Park and Rec Commission, and I thought that you all had these, so I didn't give them to Jennifer to give to you. Um, but they were already, there's two different blueprints. And I don't know if you guys can see this, um, but there's already, they had one giant baseball field set up there. And then in this one, you can see with the dark, with the building uh, stuff, it's kind of bleached out. There you go. You can see where they actually planned to do a soccer field and a softball or baseball field. Um, so when that site was being developed, and I didn't even know this, um, 
Chief Spanknable mm -hmm. is actually the one who pointed it out to me um, and got me a copy of it. Um, I have spoken to the neighbors up there, the one directly across the street and the one on the left-hand side, Mr. McCretzky, and then across the street, the other McCretzky, and they, they're both on board with it. They think it's a great idea. I talked to Chief Spanknable. He's on board. Um, and, you know, I just tried to get all my ducks in a row before I came to you. And I, I you know, I'd just like to give these girls a place that it's going to be theirs. <clears throat> Um, Jim, can you talk about, um, as, as we have talked over the, a couple of times, that uh, about your funding? I think that's going to be really important for everybody to hear, because I think it's just uh, astronomical what you have done. So can you share that with us? Yeah. So I, I knew, you know, with COVID hitting, and um, it, this has been in the, in the process for a while, but um, I spoke to Representative Kerry and asked him if there was any grants available for something like this, if some of his people could check into it for me. And he said that right now there's no grants, but he's gonna try and get it in the budget for me for next year. If we have, um, if I have the approval from you folks to use that um, for that purpose, for that land for that purpose. Um, so so we, can we can actually also tap into CPA for recreational. So um, please keep that in your forefront also um, when you're um, looking at doing this project too, because I think that we could tap into those resources. Absolutely. And we, we may end up doing that, but we want to do that for a different project that uh, Greg Lesage has got kind of tucked away at this point. And I don't know if this is the appropriate time to bring it up, but we're going to do something with Zaterka Park. And it's not going to cost you guys any money. So okay. it's going to be perfect. We love um, for that. It'll be... <laughs> It'll be useful, you know, it'll, it'll be something else that adds to the town that didn't cost the town any money. Um, but Greg's got plans for that and I'm fully behind him on that and we'll get to that when it's the time. But, um, okay, you know, it, it, I, I just, I feel bad the way it works out every year for these girls and they literally, I guess there's been a long running kind of tension between the softball and the baseball for years and I'm not going to go too deep into it but um they they just don't feel like they have a home here and and I'd like to make sure that they feel like they have a home here and well you know it's, it's starting what, to get more popular again too you know it ebbs and flows with everything a couple of years ago we only had one preschool class now we've got three it's just you know, every couple of years, and it's starting to get real popular again. They had a great season last year, which every time you have a great season, it brings out more popularity with it. So I, I, I think this will be a good thing for them. Well, when you look at the when you look at the fields that we used to have, Jim, uh, we had the field that was next to Russell School that yep. was used as a, a girls softball league. You know, that was there. We had part. Um, um, Partika Park up there. We used that also. We used over at the uh, North Hadley Hall. I mean, so there was a lot more availability uh, back in the day. And we were able to use actually down at Hopkins Academy, the front field and the back field for some of our, our meetings. But now that's all has been reconfigured and, and different than what it was, you know, you know, yeah. I'm look, I, I can't tell you how many years ago because no, that would yeah. age. That would age. Oh, I remember. So, I, so I played Lassie League in the 90s. Yeah. So yeah, it was Lassie League, exactly, Amy. Mm -hmm. So those fields were avail available back then. And um, I'm all in favor that we should, uh, you know, allow this field uh, to be made into a. Uh, a softball field so that we can, you know, accommodate the young girls in town that want to play softball and have the opportunity to do so. So, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's a good thing. And one thing that I discovered talking to people about this um, was that the SAM trail goes through there, the snowmobiles trail. Yeah. And we are not going to be putting up any fencing other than backstop and down the sides for the uh, first and third baseline that will still leave plenty of access for the snowmobiles to get through there. And, um, you know, there won't be any worries there. I hate to say, uh -huh. but the snowmobiles haven't talked to us yet. 
So, so I just have a, a quick question on like maintenance yep. and all of that. So um, who's in charge of the maintaining of it and making sure that you have everything that you need there? So um, with that being said, I, I actually reached out to uh, Chris at um, the DPW. And so long story short, um, the maintenance of the actual field itself will be the parents and coaches and people involved with softball, just like they're the ones that maintain the field um, behind the school and uh, safety complex. Um, as for the grass mowing, uh, you know, that's also going to be those same people um, because they don't have the, I, I guess, manpower or anything to help out doing that right now. And they actually don't even do the fire station right now because my question was when you go up to do the fire station and he said we actually don't do the fire station right now um so you know he said talk to david and talk to uh uh miss brennan and we'll see what happens and um so you know i mean that that's not a big deal if it comes down to it and we have to mow it for x amount of time until you know they get the manpower and time and ability to do it we'll do that i, I don't want cutting of grass to prevent these girls from getting a field. I'll put my mower on a trailer and go up and do it. So another I think question for you is you talked about it being a one of the plans being a combination uh, softball and soccer field. Will you build them both at once for the girls? Uh, no, to be honest, we don't need it. Um, we don't need another soccer field. I, I looked at that mm -hmm. and um, initially I said, well, while we're doing one, we might as well ask for the money for the other. But the way it works out now, all the U8 teams, the soccer teams, play over at Roots in Westfield. Um, so we have the U, this year we had U10s and U12s, and they played a combination of over in Westfield and at home. And we've always had enough with both boys and girls teams with just the fields behind the elementary school. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessary at this time. Um, you know, that's always something we could explore down the road because there's still going to be plenty of room between that barn and um, the backstop. So you'll be able to get all sorts of vehicles, emergency vehicles. I've heard rumors that they were going to redo that barn to make it a DPW um, storage area for the winter to keep vehicles and equipment safe. And we wouldn't interfere with that at all. I, th I think the one thing that we need to look at that we had talked about before uh, in just the configuration there was uh, a plan to put a um, shelter in for any, um, uh, how do I want to say, the dogs or animals yeah. that, that, that needed to be housed. Uh, yeah. Because right now they're being you know, taken down to DPW and that's not really a, a sufficient place for us to do. And when we bring them to any other shelters, it costs us money. So we were looking at putting up something behind there for uh, stray animals and things like that. So working in conjunction with police and fire on that to set something off to the side, be, maybe behind the uh, sub fire station so that we can, you know, get the lay of the land of where we would want to put that softball field. Okay. Actually, David Phillips, this is Mike. Yeah, go ahead, Chief. <laughs> Joyce, you're correct. We had actually designed it behind the fire station. And so I had actually, I had met with Jim and we went through that. I, I did those plans that he just showed you were part of the original um, when we did the review of the space. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were asked to overlay that. And we actually designed the driveway that comes in for our firefighters to drive in to be able to yeah. um, extend, extend a driveway away from our firefighting parking uh yeah. so i think it's i think it's a good fit and very reasonable what what jim's asking to do and it okay. wouldn't be impacted by the we were looking at a small uh containment area for uh for animals and then also a training area but that was that's okay. all behind the station okay as long and as you have it planned out where it fix, fits into what we had talked about before i don't have a problem with this whatsoever mm -hmm. And Joyce, just so you can see here, if anybody's got any problems, this little square right here that I know it's very hard to see, 
is a parking lot where you would then walk down a little path. This parking yeah. lot would be the exact same setup as right next to the safety complex where yeah. you pull in. It's just gravel. You pull in, you can pull off on both sides. And then when you get to the end, you turn around, go down a fence and exit. Um, okay. So we wouldn't even be parking over at the fire station and interrupting, you know, firefighters trying to get in there and get out of there for a call. Um, I just yeah. wanted to make sure that people were aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, so, I think it's a great thing for, for uh, use of that property. So I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve this, although I'm still a little bit stuck on the fact that there's homeless animals in town and I don't know about them. <laughs> that, that What's in town, Amy? <laughs> that there's homeless animals in town and I don't know about them. Because <laughs> <laughs> Amy will take them? Yay! Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've taken so many homeless animals. This there year. you go, Keith. <laughs> you're going to have a problem. <laughs> and Mr. Phil, can I ask you a quick question? Let me uh, let me get a quick okay. uh, second on that real quick. I'll second. All right, so second. I got Jane first there. So Amy, a motion by Amy, second by Jane, and Jim, go ahead. So I didn't get this to Jennifer um, in time. Can I ask one more thing before we before you guys continue, or does that do I have to apply for a different topic? So, yeah, it, <laughs> does it involve the softball field or no no uh, no yeah, we, we need, we need to post it. otherwise we'll get in trouble so okay yeah can we, all right so can get copies of your proposal there that you got in your hand can you get that to jennifer so she can em email it to us yep i called her today and told her you guys didn't need it because i thought you already had it because they were in the plans for the fire station and well, she ago. said, well, I was going to call you and ask you for that. And I just assumed that you guys probably had it. That was my mistake. I'll get them to you uh, and the business tomorrow. That's fine. We know what you're, where it is. No problem. Okay. And Joyce, the, the uh, animals that are confiscated, you might say, are not brought to the DPW anymore. Oh, where are they brought to, John? Did they I'm, not, I'm not sure. Animal yeah. controls take some, and I don't know what, what they do with them right now. I believe they go to Amherst uh, to their kennel. Okay. Because uh, they're... Uh, they haven't been to DPW in a couple of years now, I'm going to say. Okay. I was going to so say, they, I drove some bats up to Bernard's den. They, they so have it, to be attended when they're at a, a kennel, I guess, was the issue. And we didn't yeah, have so it, so it costs us money when we have we have to do that. So, you know, we were looking in long run having to do this. And we had talked about putting up a shelter for our own animals in town and being able to take care of them properly as we need to. Yeah. Vote on it. All right, Jennifer. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chung Lu. Yes. Wiscavitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right, thanks, Jim. Well, he's not done yet. What else he have? Well, I, the, I, Jim. I Bring it on now I, because we're coming into winter. Bring it on. Uh, but it needs to be on a no. He has he has to wait. It has to be on uh, the next agenda. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for that. <laughs> yeah. Anything um, that's not listed. Well, can I? Okay, so I was going to ask for permission to do a skating rink. Okay. The next agenda. For park and rec. Yeah, we got we got to put on the next one. All right. Just, just I'll that. get it to uh, Jennifer and. Uh, Hopefully see you next time. And it's a right. yes vote for me. You got it. <laughs> Thanks again. I really appreciate your time, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, John O'Rourke is here from Good Energy, I believe. He's been here a long time. So uh, 7.1. John, if you're ready to go, why don't you give oh, us have an eye? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the board, for allowing me to come before you tonight to give you an update on the community electricity aggregation. Um, if I could, I'd like to share my screen. Go ahead, John.
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yep. Everybody can see my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, essentially, uh, when, the, when the program started in August of 2019 at, at the launch, uh, you had um, 1,740 enrollments. Uh, at August 2021, which is the latest month we have the, um, the data for, you had 1,784, which is a good number. Uh, your maximum was in April of this year uh, of 2085, and the minimum was in February of this year of 1411. Uh, and what you'll see with these variations is that people come in and out of the program because they may see um, uh, other programs that are more um, attractive to them. Uh, but essentially, they end up coming back because in most of these situations, if they go to another program, it's only a short term um, rate, and then that rate gets uh, increased uh, sometimes significantly. So uh, essentially, you've been in a, in a reasonably tight range, uh, which is which is good for the program, and it shows a continued acceptance. Um, the rate for Eversource was just announced on Friday at uh, 13702. Uh, essentially, that's, that's a, a large increase over what it was. And I have a graph that'll show that in a little bit. Uh, right now, the, the standard in the program is 0 0.10101. That is to the meter read date this month. Uh, and that standard goes to 10.47 uh, after that meter read change. The green 100% goes from 12.9 to 14.3. Uh, essentially, what has happened there is that the renewable energy certificate prices have gone up significantly because there has been a higher demand for them recently because there are more um, communities that are looking to add renewable energy products. So that's why uh, that rate went up significantly. The uh, national energy policy and national energy um, situation has led to uh, a substantial increase in natural gas prices since um, April of this year. And as you can see, it looks like we're forming a new base uh, that is again significantly higher. Uh, that's one of the reasons why that 13.7 rate for Eversource um, was announced on Friday. We expected it to be high. We didn't expect it to be quite that high. Uh, this is uh, just a, um, a recap of Eversource rates recently back to 2018. Uh, along with the program rates. You can see the, the black line is the, uh, the standard rate uh, that has done okay uh, in terms of the Eversource rate. You're gonna see a big increase um, and, you, and we could see a big increase in the number of enrollments because people are going to start to see that 13.7 rate in their December bill. Uh, if they're not in the program now and they're on the Eversource basic rate, and you'll see more enrollments into the program. Of course, that, uh, that higher rate is the green rate. People who pick that are not concerned about price. They're more concerned about the environmental effects of having more green energy in the mix. Um, so essentially, um, you've got a good range um, in the program that shows continued acceptance. Uh, we're ex expecting that the standard product, uh, which is going to be uh, on and stable at the 10, uh, 10 4, 7 till December 2024, is gonna provide uh, long-term rate stability for the residents. And as I say, uh, there's, there's a, uh, uh, a very good chance that there'll be more enrollments 
uh, once uh, that December bill goes out to the basic service customers of Eversource. Uh, and essentially the program's going along pretty well. Uh, questions? No questions? No. Um, I am, I'll let you know, I'm always available to come and, and talk to groups in town. Uh, we especially like to talk to the seniors and I've been there to talk to the seniors a number of times. Uh, because essentially the seniors get preyed upon by unscrupulous marketers and sometimes they're not aware of exactly how much they're paying for their electricity. Uh, and we like to come to the senior centers to do presentations and uh, look at their bills to make sure that they're not getting taken by uh, unscrupulous marketers. So I'm available for that anytime. Uh so is, this is just an update and we don't need to vote on anything tonight, correct? That's correct, yeah. All right. Anybody have questions for John before we go? All right, well, thank you, John. Thank you all and have a good night. All right, you too. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Take care. All right, Let me pull down that slide. Okay. Um, now that we skipped around, let me find out. Oh, okay. Back to uh, 6.2, Hadley Farmland of Local Importance. Oh, uh, we're going to do that December 1st. I just saw that, so we'll skip that. Um, next, we'll do 6.3, Mosquito Opt-Out com uh, Committee. And the Select Board requested interested residents to submit letters of interest for the Mosquito Opt-Out Committee. Following residents have submitted letters of interest. Bobby Kamen, Shell Horowitz, Tony Lynn Morelli, Michelle Morris Friedman, and Michael Docker. Letters are attached here in board docs, but if we could get a motion to appoint those individuals to the Mosquito Opt-Out Control Committee. I'm so moved. moved. And uh, to make their appointments to the completion of the project. Correct. All right, who, I, I got three motions all at once and I couldn't <laughs> tell who said it first. I moved. I'll move. Okay. All right, Joyce made I'll the second. Motion, and Amy will second it. Any discussion on the mosquito opt-out committee appointment? I don't give you know what. I don't give what. Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call, roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Uh, Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Oh, absolutely. Wiskevitz. Roar. And Parsons. Thank you. All right, and th thank you to those people that volunteered because uh, a lot of times people thank don't you. volunteer. All right, and th thank you to those people that volunteered because uh, a lot of times people don't volunteer. Now, now I'm hearing myself. I saw Bill on there. Hi, Bill. Bill, what, what do you have? Bill, what, what do you have? Hello, should not there be a member of the select board on the committee? Should not. Bill, can you can you turn off whatever you've got? Thank you. Bill's watching us in stereo, apparently. That's a shame. <laughs> well, Linda is. Um, as I think far as having to Bill's question is, we should just have a liaison like we have to our other committees. Yeah, I, I mean, once they get a decision, they're going to have to come back to us anyway, so. Yep. With their recommendations. Anyone want to volunteer for that one? I know you do, Joyce. Oh, no. Whoever, a... whoever wanted to opt, to opt out should be the liaison. I'm that would be out. me. That will be me. Wait, what did we didn't John vote to did did John what was your vote? No. <laughs> Amy, Amy, I thought you had a real interest in that with animals. Um, Jane, I had a real interest on the other side. <laughs> Jane, are you, are you interested in being the liaison? I'd be happy. Okay. All right. 
so if everyone's okay with that, I don't even know if we need to vote on it, but Jane will be the liaison. Is that okay? Certainly. Thank you, Jane, for volunteering for that. Okay. I was more in line with what sides the plane was. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're all getting punchy. What else do we have? All right. Uh, last couple things, uh, Carolyn FY23 budget. All right, can you hear me? Because I'm using a new camera and mic, so, okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, I, I can't believe we're talking about budget already. But it's, it's beginning. It is beginning. Kill me. So, Kill me. <laughs> so I did attach a memo to board docs um, addressed to you all. Um, and I'm going to just go over it um, briefly for you. Uh, so the impact of the pandemic has lasted sig significantly longer than we had anticipated. Um, and in response, I just want to remind everybody that FY2020 and FY21 budgets were prepared in anticipation of greatly reduced revenues um, and a level tax rate was implemented. Some departments have experienced setbacks in providing the level of services they believe are, they believe are needed to appropriately serve the residents of Hadley. The attached budget worksheet, and this is just a, a sample, and I, it's the, uh, select, the select board's budget um, is on there as well. Um, the attached budget worksheet will serve as the, the guideline for departments as they prepare their FY23 budgets. The intent is to have their requests reflect the actual needs of their departments. They will need to provide a narrative to explain any increases they believe are needed. FY 2020 um, expenditures, and let's see, FY 2020 and the FY 2021 actual expenditures, FY 2022 voted budgets are also included on that worksheet so that that, that can provide a basis of comparison for the department heads. I'm entrusting the department heads to use that comparison to carefully prepare their budgets for the year ahead. Recommendations as to the COLA increases will be taken up at a later date as, we, as the finance team gathers more information and sees what's happening. Um, I, I will also send out the budget calendar um, onto, the, uh, onto you as well as the committees in the departments as well. But I just wanted to, um, that, that, that is my memo to you as how I'd like to move forward with the budget. And get your input. Sounds Thank like you. I agree that it's time that we have been very tight belted and we need to look at our needs that have increased since then and, and have a different approach now, especially since the reports from collections are that income is up in areas we were concerned about. Well, we always have to keep keep in consideration the needs of the whole town. So even though our collections are up, we can't just, you know, put that money out wherever we, we want to. Um, we have to, you know, again, take in the whole picture. Absolutely. All right. We'll let the 2023 budget fund begin. Okay. Um, Carolyn, town administrator report. Is there anything you wanted to hit in there? Yeah, there is. I, I did want to remind you that the Mass Municipal Association uh, annual conference, Amy, I can give you some more details about that conference, um, is going to be on January uh, 21st and 22nd in person, same place in Boston. So I'll get you more details about that as they come, as, once the workshops begin to get um, quantified and the more details, I'll share that with you. But just let me know if you guys would like to attend that. Um, so the staffing, as you remember at the special town meeting in the fall, there was some money allocated to provide some more support. Uh, so the, the finance department assistant, um, they are gonna be interviewing three applicants on Friday. Uh, there won't be a recommendation on Friday. There'll be some um, probably inviting some of the candidates into town hall because that interview will be done by Zoom, but I will keep you updated. Just as a reminder, that is to help uh, Linda and Joan to help uh, with some of that assistance that they've lost um, from, uh, uh, what's your name? <laughs> Stacy, moving over to DPW uh, for providing them with more support. Uh, we also are uh, meeting with an in-house employee to try to see if he can take on some of the extra hours to, to support planning board um, and some other departments, especially with agendas and minutes and things that we were lacking and was important that we would, we, we, we really need to focus on that so um, we will get some more uh, specifics for, for you for that. 
um, some good news and bad news. So um, I'm gonna do the bad news first. The grant that I wrote for MassWorks for the Route 9 re pipe replacement, um, we did not get. Um, the good news from that is that we had a chance to have a debriefing with uh, members of, um, her, her name was Jackie Furtado from the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. And there were three members of her staff and we, we looked at every part of the grant. They said it was a perfectly, it was ready, ready to break ground and everything was in place. It was well written, but because of the dynamics of the grant, it didn't fit certain criteria. Elena Cohen from Senator Comerford's office joined me in that, and it was a great opportunity for us to share with them how Hadley is so unique and isn't gonna fit in some of these very structured applications. So they're gonna use some of our feedback in the next round. Um, so the other good thing is, is that it opened up a door for some discussion about other opportunities that we could apply for. And I am going to be working with uh, members from that cabinet to look at uh, an opportunity to sit, submit five priority infrastructure projects. And I'll be working with DPW and Chris to kind of highlight what I think and he thinks are some of the five specifically stormwater drainage issues um, that are it would be extremely expensive for us to um, try to have the town support that. So we're going to look at some additional opportunities to do that. Uh, so we also did not get the Russell School Feasibility Reuse Grant, and I am still waiting. They're, they're going to do a debriefing, um, I don't think until mid-December, to explain why we didn't fit that, because I, I'm when I called, they said this was a perfect match. So I'll be it'll be interesting to get that. But we did express, I we've been talking a lot with Senator Comerford and uh, Dan, Dan Carey about the challenges that uh, Hadley continues to face that we're just not fitting into some of these, these grant programs because of the uniqueness. We're considered rural, we have a low tax rate, but yet we have uh, you know, the equivalent of West Springfield in commercial with Route 9. So I just wanted to let you know we are making some present, presence at the state level with, with some of the challenges that we're having. So that's all I have for the- Thank you. You're welcome. Great, so I think that's everything, uh, announcements. Yes, tomorrow at the Senior Center at two o'clock, the post office is going to present uh, recognition to the safety complex and the Senior Center for their work with seniors during COVID. And you're all invited. I also? Yes. <laughs> Who said yes? Me? I said yes. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> so we have a couple of, of, of good things to say. We have the uh, holiday um, festival that will happen uh, the day after Thanksgiving because we won't be meeting again. So they'll have carols, the lighting of the tree, and the fire department will be there to collect unwrapped new gifts for Shriners. Um, so if you have a donation, please bring them to there. They will also be having uh, more uh, collections at the fire station as we go through the season. Um, so come out and join us and sing and have a good, hopefully the weather will hold out for us the day after Thanksgiving. Um, that was a good note. So uh, on the sad note, uh, I have a couple of passings. Um, one of them is uh, Beth Cook, who is my neighbor, uh, has been a friend, uh, met her many years ago when our kids were in school. Her son, Nate, used to come to my house and shoot hoops with my son. Um, I would always like the grill. The kids were always welcomed at the house. Um, and Beth was just a good um, person. She was always had a smile on her face, always laughed. Um, she told me at the time when I first met her that she had a crush. She was from Sunderland and my cousin was from South Deerfield. And she told me, oh, I always had a crush on your, your cousin, Harry. Um, so we started out our life and our, 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 our presentation together. And as life went on, she had 
you know, four great children uh, with Gordon. Um, her lifelong dream was to set up flavors. Um, she put her whole heart into that business and making it an ice cream place, which has become very popular over the years. Um, so we will miss Beth. She was a light of everybody's life, whoever knew her. And so I, my condolences and our select board condolences to her and her family. She was really a good person. My second condolences is to the family of Marianne Kowal, uh, who passed away uh, last week. Um, Marianne was a quiet person, yet um, I knew her personally, of course, um, through the hospital. She was an RN at the hospital that um, had worked there for many years. And uh, Marianne Ann and I connected on the Joint Center when we first, when the Joint Center was uh, first started. And, um, you know, she was just a compassionate nurse. She loved her patients. Um, she took good care of them. She was just a really good person. She loved her family. Um, she was just, she came from a large family. Uh, her maiden name was Gonski from Northampton. And, um, you know, you couldn't ask for a better person than Marianne also. So our condolences to Marianne's family and uh, we wish all of them our condolences for this year. Any more announcements? Uh, I, we didn't get to ask Mr. Dwyer if he is interested in helping Randy and Lieutenant Cook on Mountain Road. He's still on. Bill, are you still there? Or? I'll try to catch him tomorrow then. Yeah, we're, he's ha we're having, um, we have internet issues up at the house and I know he's watching it on TV, but. Oh, okay. Well, he, if you can ask him, I'll no, try he's, to up with him Computer's tomorrow. frozen. Okay. I'll, I'll try to catch up with him tomorrow then, Linda. He can hear you. <laughs> he's watching on the uh, TV, so alrighty. All right, last call. All right, next meeting, December 1st, if I could get a motion to adjourn. Wait, we need to, the last thing is, is that happy Thanksgiving to everybody to every, you know, hope you have a great day and enjoy the, hopefully the long weekend for everybody. So happy Turkey day. Yes. And, and a reminder that the uh, town, the town buildings are closed on Friday. Thank you. And I also would want to say for the next month of December, um, our Legion dinner is on the third Wednesday of the month and I won't be here. So I don't know if we wanted to readjust our meetings. Yeah, um, we may hold a meeting on not on a Wednesday, but we just need to work on some details for that. Uh, other than there's no Legion dinner on the first, is there? Correct, not. Okay, so we'll just that we'll figure that out next meeting. We just want to get some details worked out. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn, please. Someone don't move. move. Second. Uh, <laughs> I got Joyce and Amy. I think for a second. All right. And for roll call. Roll call vote. Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Sorry, someone's here. <laughs> and David, uh, just to maybe a reminder to everybody that there's free COVID testing at the senior center, and the dates and times are on the town calendar. Perfect. Do you have anything for us to sign, Jennifer? I always have stuff for y'all to sign. <laughs> Carolyn, yes. yes. I'm sorry, there is a, uh, another um, vaccine, free vaccines at Hampshire Mall. I want to say it's the 27th, but I will email those and, and we can get that correctly. We'll, we'll get it on the website as well. Um, and I am going to get more. I think it was the 27th, wasn't it? It was I'm the 27th, sorry. but they hadn't told us the date yet, which is why I hadn't mentioned it. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So we'll get that more specific. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're done. I'm really done. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.